I'm Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview. On today's show, I'll talk to comedian Rich Scheidner, who, in addition to touring, as all sturdy stand-ups do, is on the verge of releasing a memoir, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Explosion, and a short film he wrote, The Last Lift of the Leg, is also due out soon. Stick around. Apparently, there was a comedy explosion in the 80s killing everyone but today's guest. Today's interview with comedian Rich Scheidner is unusual for at least three reasons. First of all, Scheidner is the first guest of my tenth year of producing the Mr. Media podcast, which he just found out now. Second, he may be the first guest I've ever connected with as a Facebook friend first and then invited to be a guest on the show. And third, he may be the least self-promotional comic I've ever encountered. How's that, you wonder? Well, when I asked him if he had anything special coming up that he wanted to promote, well, he mentioned performing at the Borgata, Borgata in Atlantic City from January 24th to 30th. Anything else, I asked. I'll be at Cleveland Hilarities February 3rd to 6th, he replied. Which left me thinking, is this the only comedian in America not hosting his own podcast? Now, as it turned out, the modest Mr. Scheidner has two big projects on the verge of release. First is a memoir, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Explosion, which he hopes to have out very soon. And he also wrote a short film, The Last Lift of the Leg, which he screened with a live audience for the first time at the Tribeca Theater in New York City just about a week ago. And with that, Rich Scheidner, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. My pleasure. Are you, are you that modest, or did you just not think it was worth mentioning those things? No, I, I, you, you nailed it. I've had a very hard time with self-promotion. I know it's all uh, my insecurity, self-esteem, whatever, but I've never been good at it. I should have changed my name early in my career, and I could have worked harder for that guy. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, uh, maybe maybe we'll help you out a little bit here today. We'll see what happens. All right. So all right. here's the thing. I, 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 thinking about it, I, I feel very confident that I've seen you live uh, probably during the area of your memoir, uh, the 1980s. Uh, I'm thinking that it was a time that my wife and I went out to comedy clubs all the time, wherever we were. If we were visiting another city, we'd always go to the comedy club. But here in the Tampa Bay area, uh, we most often would go to Ron Bennington's club in Clearwater, Florida, or Bob, Sh- Bob Shoemaker's uh, Coconuts Comedy Clubs. And now I know the, com- the coconuts now are, th- are thought of as maybe a lower rung, but 30 years ago, is it possible that I saw you at any of these places? It is possible. I mean, I played Tampa area I, uh, back in the 80s, early 90s. You know, I stopped touring probably around 95 or 96, as, as you know from uh, Jordan's documentary, I Am Comic. But uh, back at that time, I played – I played. the only time I did a Coconuts was they had me headline their comedy festival. Down, I think it was down in Miami. Oh. And this might have been early 90s. Okay. And, uh, I, I don't remember it. I played – I think Bendigan's down in Clearwater, I think. Did, did that was also a live music venue. Was that a live mu- music venue, too? Um, mostly I remember it as being a comedy club. It was, uh, okay, I think yeah. there was a place in Clearwater I played it. Also, Dave Mason, the, the, the rocker who was former member of Traffic, he played there at the same time. So I, I, it's a, I can't really remember much about those places. <laughs> That's okay. I just thought I'd ask. I feel really confident that I've seen you live, and it, you know, there's so much uh, – so much. I did a lot of live past. shows. I can tell you that I did a lot of live shows. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I just you know I'm just curious. Now, uh, as you mentioned, I think the other reason that you are familiar to me is that uh, uh, we have a mutual acquaintance, Jordan Brady, uh, who's been on this show uh, twice. Uh, once to promote I Am Comic, and then we came back to promote I Am Road Comic. I know you were in I Am Comic, um, and I just kind of new one not called I Am Retired Comic. Have you seen that one yet? No. Is that true? <laughs> an hour and a half of him just sitting around the house <laughs> Facebook just Facebook and tweeting that's all he does well, an hour and a half it's very interesting well I was going to say and now he's doing a podcast so yeah. you know podcast podcast is like it's 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 a fun it's sort of like when you're not really in show business that's good make believe that you're in show business I've seen guys like post going I'm going to go tape a show today and I go what show to go it's a podcast because that's not a show <laughs> a show is when you go to the gate and the guard has to let you on the studio lot see Podcast is like comedic circle jerk. 
Like you come on my show, I'll come on your show, and we'll make believe we're in showbiz. That's great. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm making a note to send uh, to send an email out to uh, Hardwick and Marin. No, those guys. There's three guys. There's three or four guys. Actually, there's three or four guys. But, you know, there's thousands and thousands of them. Sure, there's three or four guys. Hardwick makes money. Mark Marin. I'm not doubting that. Oh, I know. Those guys. But you know what I mean? Most of it. I'm just talking. I look, I do everyone everyone asks. I do them because they've helped me out in so many ways. I'm just making a joke about it. But you know, I've, I, nobody's ever come and gone, hey, I heard you on that podcast. I heard you on that podcast. You know, <laughs> I heard you on Shmuley's podcast. You're a killer on Shmuley's podcast. No, Mark Marin, you know, um, uh, Corolla. Yeah, they're guys who make, you know, they're, they're a big podcast, no doubt. Yeah, they're more the exception to the rule, I think, than the rule. There's a lot of oh, guys. Yeah. And, and of course, I always run with the rule. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of guys out there who are doing them, and they just sit in front of a microphone themselves for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and they got nothing to say. And and it's just they do it because they started doing it. Now they got to keep doing it. And uh, now I'm, I'm I know I'm treading on thin ice here because here I am in <laughs> my tenth year, right? but I don't bill myself as a stand-up comedian. I'm just a guy who likes to talk to people, and hopefully, uh, you know, the guest makes things interesting. I know nobody's tuning in for me. No, I'm talking for stand-up comics who would rather do anything that, than write a joke. It's always preferable. I'll do a podcast. I'll sit and talk for two hours. Anything, but I have to actually do what I need to do. Sure. I get it. I do the same. I got it. Well, so I have to ask, did you get a better buzz out of uh, Jordan's uh, movie than you did after uh, beside, uh, in, uh, overdoing a podcast interviews? <laughs> I love doing Jordan's movie. That was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. It was it, everything changed all the time, and it got me back to him doing stand-up. He, 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 he and that movie got me going back into uh, and doing stand-up and, and getting on stage again. So it was, you know, it was great, great for me. It was a terrific movie. If people haven't seen it, you should look it up. It's uh, uh, Rich is on it, uh, Sarah Silverman. Uh, uh, I, a lot of, you know, Greg Girardo and, and, and Robert Schimmel, who both, it was some of the last the meaningful interviews to me. It was, you know, we asked Schimmel, there's, Anything would ever stop him from doing stand up, and he said nothing. Uh, Gerardo talked about the visceral addiction of it. These are very, it's, it's a great, it's a great documentary. I had a great experience with Schimmel uh, several years ago. He, uh, for the life of me, I can't remember how I got in contact with him, but we connected and he agreed to come on Mr. Media when it was just a, an audio podcast, and uh, it was supposed to be 20 minutes. And he kept going and going and going. We got over an hour, and I said, well, Robert, I'm so grateful. This has so been great to talk to you. He says, I'd like to do it again. Can I come back? And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I think it was, it was, great. It was like three or four weeks later, he came back and did another hour. And I'm thinking, what would I have had to pay as a promoter to have Robert Schimmel come on and drop by my house and do two hours of material, you know? <laughs> well, he was great, man. Yeah. He was great. So that's something if people want to look it up, look that up. Oh, I know, I know why we connected. His book had just come out. It was cancer on five dollars a day. <laughs> Shimmel, yeah, that was fun. Um, okay, so uh, as we're talking today, it's uh, January twenty fifth, and you are at the Borgata this week in Atlantic City. And I gotta ask you, uh, anything uh, make the start of this week's show a little unusual than the usual weather, perhaps? Yeah, we had a big snowstorm. Uh, I was supposed to go to Miami from Philly to do a one-nighter and then come back to come to Borgata in Atlantic City. And the snowstorm knocked out the one-nighter and we just holed up and shoveled snow and then came down here. Snow all the way down. So it's, you know, you forget, man, weather, weather. You live in L.A., it's like there's no weather, no weather, unless it's an earthquake. And I don't know if you can count that as weather, but it's really not, you know, it's just no weather that affects things like here. Have you been? Have you been affected? Uh, I mean, today is Sunday. This big. I mean, today is Monday. Big storm was Friday night, Saturday, yeah. into Sunday a bit. Ha- has it affected you at all? Uh, well, it cost me a gig. It cost me some money, but you know, not like other people. I can't really complain. It just happened. It happened, and 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 got uh, Bobby Kelton to, to fill in for me down in Miami, the thing I was supposed to do, and then that's it. No, it's, but the, last night there were a few hundred people here to Borgata. This is a really great casino in Atlantic City and there were a few hundred people and they had a great time. It was a great show. I guess it was people probably who were staying in the hotel more than people who were coming from a distance particularly. I yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I, never, I never pulled a crowd. I just, uh, <laughs> I probably should. You, you, didn't, you didn't ask each one of them where they were from? and I mean, 
So it yeah. was a smaller than usual crowd, I'm guessing. It was a smaller than usual crowd, but still there were a couple hundred people the day of the storm. That's, that's pretty good. And do you, uh, you know, because we, you don't get to work in blizzards very often, did you, was was your act or any, uh, you, you're headlining, obviously, uh, w- did you do anything differently because of the weather and the crowd? I, t- I, I talked about snow. I talked about growing up in the snow. I talked about being back in New Jersey, which is where I'm from, and um that's it, you know. I mean, the, the drive down. You know, I, I came down with Alan Bursky, who's a city boy. You know, he, he really grew up in New York City and he grew up in Los Angeles. So when he gets into the back roads and he doesn't see towns and he doesn't see street lights and he's driving and seeing fields next to us, you know, he thinks he's in Deliverance. He thinks he's, you know. <laughs> well, of so course, that's fun. That's always fun. If he's seen The Sopranos, he should probably be a little concerned in that part of Jersey. Uh, yeah, get down to the pines when they had the Russian running around, right? I remember that. Yep. And the snow, too. Yep. It was good. Or when they took uh, Drea Mateo's uh, character uh, out uh, out into the Pine Barrens. So, you know, maybe maybe he wasn't so far off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you are a Jersey boy, as am I. Where are you from? Pennsville, a little small town on the Delaware River, right across from Wilmington, Delaware. Hmm. That's, where I, that's where I grew up. Do you still have family there? Actually, no, I have friends there, and a cousin lives in the next town, but all my family is sort of gone, mm. gone. My mm-hmm. parents live in Florida, my brother in Florida, my other brother's just moving to Florida, my sister in Mississippi. Yeah, nobody's really, you know. Well, and it's a big surprise. You know I'm in Florida. Folks, come on in. I've got, I've got Rich's parents right here. No, surpri- <laughs> no. sorry. I, I, I would have the video turned on if I had done that. Just checking. Um, so... I, how is the comedy scene different today from, from what you've written about in the book? Obviously, I read a little excerpt from the book. It's online. People can see it at your website. But how is the scene different today than, you know? It's, it, it, the basic mechanics of making people laugh I don't think is different. George Burns said the comedic soul is eternal. The people are the same. The comics are the same personality. But when I started, I mean, I kind of did a rough count of the amount of comics, professional comics, to what I would say late-nighters uh, in the business back in 1979. I started in 77. When I got to New York, about about 400 comics in the whole country, from like Robin Williams and Steve Martin, Richard Pryor, Carlin, down to the bottom of guys just barely scraping any kind of money out of the business. There are 400 comics in Toledo now. There's so many comics. There's more comics available than audience members. I mean, you go to open mics... In Los Angeles, and there's 15 comics performing for 15 comics. They, they can't get people audience. It's the, but there but it, there are there are more comics making more money now than ever. It's more popular than ever. There are more comics doing theaters and 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 arenas, and they're more popular and drawing more people. But there's no middle class. There's no middle class. There's either guys making that much, and if you can't draw, then in terms of the comedy clubs. You're just sort of like a generic, you know, like a, there's a bucket of squirming worms and they just take one out and put it on the hook and see what it brings in, you know, because they pay them a flat fee. Like it's a sort of, it's hilarious. Like all across the country, every comedy club basically pays 250 a set for a headliner who's unknown. Hmm. It's, a, it's amazing how they all came up with the same figure. It's, <laughs> how low can we go? What can we get away with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you can draw, you can you can make huge amounts of money in a comedy club. And the comedy clubs are bigger. All these improvs and, and stand-up live in Phoenix, there's like five, six, seven hundred seat rooms for comedy. And when, when the comedy clubs first started, they were all like two to three hundred seat rooms. They were they were not that size at all. It's all gotten much bigger. Well, of course, when you started up – now, now help me with perspective. When you started uh, in the late 70s, was that before or after – the big uh, strike out at uh, Mitzi's. Uh... The, the strike. The strike was seventy nine. Okay. I started in seventy seven in Washington D.C. and then moved to New York in seventy nine. And the comedy clubs really started popping in eighty. And, and east of the Mississippi in in, in nineteen seventy nine, there was there was one comedy club, Garvin's in Washington D.C. that paid out of town comics to come in and perform. Really, and there might have been. Occasionally, somebody in Philly would pay somebody to come in or the club, but a little bit of money, maybe. The, there were comedy scenes in Boston and Philly and Washington, D.C. There were comedy scenes in Houston in the late 70s and San Francisco, of course. But 
comedy clubs. And then 1980, the comic strip in Fort Lauderdale opened. And then clubs just started popping. Ridley's in Detroit and uh, uh, the Comedy Castle there and, and Philly clubs. And all of these clubs started opening up just everywhere, you know, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. And, and, uh, and it started just popping. What, do, you, do you think that the quality of the comics is any better today? Are they smarter? Do they, do oh, they understand well, it as a craft? They, I, I, I think the craft is getting better all the time. The younger comics have advanced it. They, 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 they come preloaded. You know, when I was growing up, you'd watch comics on cars once in a while when I was really young. You know, Ed Sullivan show would put them on. And you'd see these five-minute snatch, little snapshots, little five-minute spots. And, and, and I'd always watch them. And, but you couldn't record them and study them. And these people grow up. They, they, they watched a million comics before they first hit the stage. They come preloaded. These younger comics are so fast and so, you know, I, 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 it's just like athletics. It just gets better and better. The athletes get bigger and faster. And I think the comics are, are, are quicker and sharper and digging harder. They have to dig harder. They have to, and talk about promotion, they have to do more self promotion. We just had an 8 by 10 We'd give to the comedy club. They'd nail it to the front door. The place was packed. Right. We didn't have to do any self promotion. Did you, uh, do you ever go see a young comic these days? Were you, uh, you know, I don't go out and seek it. I don't. I, I. I. Somebody sends clips, and I watch. You know, on Facebook or YouTube, I watch people. Uh, I don't really go out to the clubs. Now you mentioned that uh, in the '90s, and I didn't really realize this. In the '90s, you had stepped aside from all this. You kind of retired from the from the road. What what, what would, led to that? I was, I was writing. I had kids. I had kids, and. Um, I don't know. There are a lot of factors. I can't blame my kids. I don't want to say blame them, but I didn't want to go on the road. I know that. So I started writing for TV. Roseanne was my first writing job. And I started going that way so I could stay home more. And then I sort of, I don't know, got away from it, lost it. I don't know. Got resentful with comedy. I don't know what happened. But uh, I'm glad I got back to it. I'm glad you did too. I got to ask you. So I, I'm, I'm at lunch last week. Every week I have lunch with the same guy on Wednesday. Uh, his name is Chuck Shepard. Chuck, uh, I don't know if the name will mean anything to you. I'll tell you why I bring it up in a second. But Chuck is probably best known to most people. He writes a weekly newspaper column and has for at least 20 or 30 years called News of the Weird. It's in – Oh, I love that. That's him? That's him. Oh, that's I, – I read that in funny times all the time. Well, he will he will be delighted to hear that because he remembers you particularly, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so we're having lunch last week. And I mentioned that I'm looking forward to talking to you. And he says, Rich Scheidner? I said, yeah. So he says, I, I met him. I said, okay. I'm thinking, you know, what at a club after a show or something. But here's the deal. He said that um, in, the, in the early 80s, I want to say, Ooh. in Washington, Baltimore area, he said you were up and coming guy, uh, already, you know, getting paid. He was uh, – he was doing stand-up at open mics and all those kind of places and that he ran into you frequently and that you were – I guess you were very nice to him. And that I guess you have some mutual friends. Uh, he mentioned Dan, the club owner at K Street Club and Sam Greenfield. Oh, my gosh. Now, he doesn't expect you to remember him. I think he's going to be very flattered that you read News of the Weird. Oh, I love News of the Weird. That's the thing I look forward to when I get funny times. I, that's that's my favorite thing about it. Um, um, Do you remember that time at all? DC. Oh, I, yeah, I started DC. I started there. there were, first, I started. There were no comedy clubs. I, I went on a place called um, uh, Iguana Coffee House. Howard Vine, a friend of mine in law school, uh, said, "You know, you're funny. You should go down and perform." I don't even know if we knew it was called stand up. I'd seen obviously lots of stand ups on television and live. And uh, he took me to a place, Iguana Coffee House, and I went and performed for the first time there. And then I was performing around D.C. a lot for about six months. I opened up for the Ramones. I was getting a little bitty, weird work. Oh, yeah, that's a funny story in itself. And then um, L. Brookman's, a place called L. Brookman's Open. I was just going to mention that that's where he said that he particularly knew you from. Yeah, that's where that's where I'm sure we hung out there. And that and then all the and a, a friend of mine in in school said. Showed me like a, you know, it was a classified in the Washington Post. Said, anybody wants to do comedy, come to this place, L. Brookman's. And I went there and there was Kevin Rooney and, and, and Louis Black was there. And, 
and and Ron Zimmerman and John Heyman and Bill Masters and and I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but but there, there were a lot of comics who who sort of T.P. Mulroney that gravitated to this place and uh, started doing comedy on weekends there. How cool! Well, I'm so glad to hear that uh, he uh, his memory is not faded. <laughs> was that was that his line? You know, was that his line? There was a line somebody. You know, they, they'd say, how do you get to El Brookwood? Because it was down in southeast Anacostia, across the Anacostia Bridge. It was a tough neighborhood. And somebody said, how do you get to El Brookwood? And he go, drive until you're scared. Drive on Pennsylvania Avenue until you get scared. That's what he said. He said that at lunch. That's his, I that's don't know. his line? I, I can't swear that it's, it's his, so- but he quoted that line to me at lunch last week. <laughs> That's it's so, so true, funny. man. It's, it's so true. Such a small world. That's just, you know, I, I, I can't get over that. Yeah, I, I, here's the – the folks won't be able to see this because I'm not on video. But on here, it says – this is his handwriting. L. Brookman's, Rich Scheidner, uh, down at the bottom, it says Dan, the club owner at K Street Club. And then on the side, it's uh, Sam Greenfield, uh, who I guess was a comic and an MC. Oh, the K – I never worked the K – the K Street Club was the one above the strip joint. Is that what he's talking about? Uh, maybe. I, I, yeah, I worked at Garvin's, Harry Monte Cristo's own Garvin's. That was up on Connecticut Avenue. That opened up after that opened up in '79. You know, uh, El, El Brookman's had opened for about a year and a half up to that point. But El Brookman's was a small, like an eighty seat bar down in a rough neighborhood. It was packed all the time, but it was it was a you know it it, it was not going to get the kind of crowd that it got in Northwest Washington. Uh, you know, at, at El Brook at, at, at Garvin's. Well, that's so nice. Yeah. I've- Chuck will appreciate that uh, you, you remember that time. So that must have been a pretty exciting time in your life. You're just getting started, and you're coming out and doing clubs. Yeah, and I, I, when I when I first moved to New York, it was very exciting. I, I I had to make the decision to drop law and to go into comedy. And and you know, my mom screamed. My dad was like, you know, he was apoplectic. Uh, uh, but I, I had to go do it. I just I just got addicted. I just got so thoroughly addicted. And. Uh, and so when I moved to New York City, it was it was pretty exciting. There were a lot of comics up there. There were about about a hundred comics up in three different clubs: Catch a Rising Star, the Improv, and the Comic Strip hmm. were the main clubs, the main comedy clubs, showcase clubs. They weren't paying any money, but that's where the comics went and and worked out every night. Actually, I'm, I'm just thinking as you said that about I, I didn't know that you had, uh, started off uh, studying law. That may be the connection that uh, Chuck was uh, was a lawyer and actually a uh, clerk uh, for. Uh, Supreme Court justice, as I recall. Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, I, yeah he was a real lawyer. Yeah, he was. See, I was at law school. First of all, I was at a law school when I first went there. It was really it was it wasn't unaccredited. It was the International School of Law and Screen Door Repair. It wasn't. <laughs> really, so then it then it got hooked up with George Mason University while I was there. So when I I didn't I didn't put in for my degree. I, I moved to New York, and then a friend of mine said he was over at the office today. They, they want to know where you are. You you didn't put in to get your grad. You're, you're eligible to get a degree, so they sent it to my parents. So I have a law degree, but I never practiced law or anything. Interesting. All right. Well, so all right, let's come back. Got to tell me. You said it was a good story about the opening for the Ramones. I want to hear it. Oh, oh. So so I'm doing it for a couple of months. I'm doing this is '77, and I'm just going around. I'm, Friends of mine have bar bands. I'm going on when they take a band break. I jump on stage and try to do comedy. It's all kamikaze stuff. I go into a pizza joint, talk to the guy, and let me do comedy in front of his customers. There's no place to go. Then of course all these singer songwriter nights. So I'm hanging out at the place called the Child Harold, which was down on Dupont Circle, and uh, Bill Hurd was the was the owner, and and. My friend was a bartender, told Bill, because I was always funny in the bar, he's, and he goes, what's, that? what's with that guy? He goes, you know, he's doing comedy now. So the guy comes over to Bill Hurd and says, you're doing comedy? I said, yeah. I, I said, yeah, sure, I didn't know. You know. He goes, you want to open up for this band next week? I'll give you $50. Now, it was a good business move for him because by the record company required him to have an opening act. So instead of paying some local band a couple hundred bucks, he pays me for 50 So I go, I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, I'm crazy, fantastic. I got to do this. Next week I come, I don't even know who the band is. Outside on the marquee from New York City, the Ramones. I walk in, the place is packed with punks. I don't know what punk is. It's 1977, you know. I'm in my post hippie sort of painter bib overalls with, you know, t shirts and, and, and kind of longish hair. I walk in, there's mohawks, there's shaved heads, it's all flannel and leather, and, you know, the whole energy's like, ah, ah, ah. And I go back to the bar, and Bill Hurd's just laughing. He's like, they're going to kill you, man. They're going to kill you. You're not going to make 15 minutes. And I was like, I'm going to make that 15 minutes because I want that 50 bucks. You know, to me, it was like a rodeo event. I'm going to stay on till the buzzer goes, no matter what the bolt does. And uh, so 
He says, you're not going to make five minutes. I'll go double or nothing. You won't make five minutes. So I said, I'll take it. And he introduced me, and it was like, I don't know what they said, but I know all the audience heard was, ladies and gentlemen, not the Ramones. <laughs> they hated I had to walk through the crowd. It wasn't like I'd come around to the side of the stage. I had to walk right through the middle. It was like a biblical scene. It was biblical. They were spitting. It was like they were, they were like, you know, it was like a Barabbas coming through. The, it was just spitting and throwing stuff. And, and I get that. They're booing me. It's just constant. But there wasn't one. I don't remember anybody going, hey, fantastic. It was the whole crowd hated me before I got on the stage. And you can't do comedy when they hate you. You can't. But I try anyway because I don't know what else to do. I've only been doing it a couple months. It's not like I can go. I'll do my special punk material that I wrote last night or, or I'm going to improv, you know, I'll, I'll wing it. You know, where are you from? What do you do? I don't know anything. I just now to do this little act that I've written from A to B to C to D. You know, I'm from New Jersey and they're just <laughs> doing. So I maybe spoke for a half a minute, a minute. One of the guys sitting ringside had had it, you know, and they had these mugs of beer and he just, you know, just shot his mug of beer at me. He just hits me with a beer. I mean, I'm lucky that he just didn't knock me in the head with a beer mug. Huh. And I just, I don't even, I just shake it off. I just got hit like with ocean spray. I'm standing in front of the boat. I just kind of shake it off and go right back to my act, you know. Anyway, my dad said, right back to my act. That's all I <laughs> And so they all just start throwing beers. They all, I mean, they just all, I mean, they're just all throwing beers. The people are coming up front. And my friend said it was hilarious because every time they'd hit you with a beer, the whole crowd would cheer. And then you'd start talking, it all boo. He said it was the most schizophrenic performance he'd ever seen. It was like, yay, boo, yay, boo. And it didn't take a couple of minutes. I mean, it's not like I was a big state. It was a little six-inch riser, wooden pallet, you know, practically, you know. that I was standing right in front of the drum kit. There's amplifiers inside side, side of me. It was tight in the little stage. So... Bill Hurd's in the back. It took him no time at all to figure out all this beer being thrown towards electrical equipment was not a smart idea. So he's just waving the money. Come get your money. Come on, come get your money. <laughs> I go back into the, there's no dressing room. There's just the kitchen behind the bar. I go through into the kitchen. Ramones are standing there waiting to come on. They're there. You know, I don't know. These guys, long hair, leather guitars. They're just standing there. I walk back. I am soaked from head to toe with beer. <laughs> One of Ramones looks at me. He goes, Cool act, man. <laughs> That's a great story. That's yeah. a great story. And, and I'll tell you, Denim, Bill Hurd, I became his hero for like, he, he, he loved me. He loved me. We drank. He said, you got to come open up for somebody else next week. So I go back the next week and I open up for somebody else and I do okay. But it's the same act, right? So then he says, come back the next week. I got another thing for you. I come back the next week, open. I start my act. He just starts screaming, what is this? What is this? He walks to the front seat. You're doing the same freaking act. <laughs> like, he doesn't get it. He thinks I'm supposed to do the I, the last two times, now the third time. You're doing the same stupid act. I'm not paying you for the same act. <laughs> he does, he's ignoring it. Anybody else is laughing. He was pissed. <laughs> it wasn't making him laugh. And that's the last time he ever hired me. Wow. And I'd come in the bar, and he'd look at me, like, give me a dirty look like I stole his $50 that last time because he paid me the 50 for the last time, too. And he just kind of looked at me like, there's a guy that does the same stupid act every time. Oh my god, that's that's great. That's a great story. And you know, as you were telling it, I'm, I'm reminded of something that's kind of the inverse of that. It was a, a musician opening for Steve Martin um, at a, a much bigger place. It was uh, the uh, uh, the was that Steve Goodman. Steve Goodman, yes. Yeah. So uh, Steve Martin had been on Saturday Night Live. It was the the weekend that he had debuted the King Tut song. Oh, they had just done it, and I had tickets. Uh, I had a, and it, I had a date, and I had tickets to see Steve Martin at the uh, Rutgers Fieldhouse. Um, <laughs> and it it was just it was brand new. It may have been one of the first events that they had, and it was either the next night or two or or it was either Sunday night or Monday night. And um, but it was the first gig that Steve did after King Tut. Uh, immediately after he did it on Saturday Night Live, so Steve Goodman opens, and it was just exactly what happened to you. People, first of all, there was n- they did him the disservice. There was no announcement of an opening act, so everybody's keyed up. Oh, we're going to see Steve Martin. This is going to be great. You know, let's get small. And anyway, Steve Goodman comes out with his guitar and he starts singing, and people are like, "What the f- is this?" And they're screaming and yelling, and people are throwing stuff. And I, I mean, I'm in the same boat as people. I'm thinking, well. 
I, I didn't come here to see this guy. I came here to see Steve Martin. And we didn't know who he is. The, the announcement wasn't loud enough that you knew what his name was. He just comes out and starts singing. It's like he came out of the crowd as far as anybody knew. And he got booed off the stage. Oh, it was terrible. And later the, the poor guy died, and I felt terrible. Again, all over again when he died. But, you know, and Steve Martin comes out, and everybody goes crazy. But it, it had to be the very same thing for him that you went through. It's just like, you well, know. It- yeah, I did a lot of, you know, as, as I worked on, that was the only work I could get in, in Washington, D.C. I opened up for a lot of bands down there. There was there were several halls, the Cellar Door, the Bayou. I worked a lot of places, Warner Theater. I worked a lot opening act stuff. And it was brutal sometimes because I'd walk out. They weren't expecting to see comedy. This is, this is before comics were so ubiquitous. And so I sort of developed a couple of lines. And one of them, they'd start booing. I said, look, I'd tell them, I go, look, I'm the opening act. I'm out here for 15 minutes. If you kill me now, they will not come out any faster. They will not be out here any quicker. They're not going to be out here for 15 minutes. If you kill me now, you're just going to watch my body decompose for 15 minutes. <laughs> and you see that guy to laugh, and I can move on and try to get some comedy in. But sometimes people just yell, let's kill him. They, they didn't care. <laughs> I but so Steve Martin, tell- people forget how big he was. And he was, he was the first rock star comic. There's no doubt about it. He was huge and crazy. I remember I saw him. In three stages in D.C., the first time I saw him, I think it was a cellar door or maybe to buy. It was just a couple hundred people. It was a small place. It was a cellar door, I think. My friend took me. And then I saw him like at a thousand seat theater. It might have been at George Washington. It might have been a listener at George Washington. And then I saw him at the Capitol Center, the Capitol Center. I couldn't believe it. I was going there with like 15,000 people to watch this guy. And everybody was shouting out his punchlines. <laughs> They were literally like it was like a concert where people were singing along with Springsteen. Right, exactly they were, what I was thinking. Yep. Yeah, it was beyond comedy. It was so far beyond comedy then. There, and there have been a few things like that since, but it was really hard to match that. It was not, and you know, thirty, forty years, thirty years earlier, twenty, thirty. I don't know how long it'd be. You know, when when Jack Benny or Bob Hope tour. Bob Hope was the comedian who draw big crowds, but nobody was doing his punchlines. You know, that was yeah, it was pretty strange. Oh. So uh, you told me the Ramon story. Now, I don't know if that would qualify as one of the best stories of that period of your career or one of the worst, but tell me some of the, tell me some of the things that made you want to write a book about that era. Well, a lot of things, I, you know, because there was – it wasn't just all about that. You know, I, like um, I also wanted to find out why I did it or why other people did it. To me, uh, that comedy is such an extreme – Art form is such an extreme job choice. Like we've all known a lot of funny people. I knew fun- I grew up with people who I can name them. You know, Tim McAllister, Jack Glutus, Cam Melchior. These people were funny as I was, funnier. But they never went on stage. They never had an urge to go do this. So I go, what? Why did I go do it and they didn't? And I, I so I was exploring those things. I kind of came up with a theory, and it's my, uh, I call it my Prince. POW theory. <laughs> it, to go on and do stand up comedy, you were probably raised either a prince or a POW. Because the prince is raised with such adulation. Everything the prince or the princess does when they're growing up is applauded, glorified. They get such love and affection and so much esteem when they come out into the real world. Where are they going to go find a job where they're going to get that much love and support? They could host The and Apprentice. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. So, you know, so they they, they do comedy. I mean, if you if you if you're bent towards comedy, I just this is given the fact that you're funny. So, comedy is a natural place for them to go. And when they're performing, it's like um, it's a a a joyful performance. They're up there going, "Look, mom, no hands." You know, and it's fantastic. And then the other. Side of it would be people who are raised um, like like POW. They're beaten emotionally, physically. They're treated like dogs. So they come out in the world. Where are they going to get the love they never got or the recognition they never got? So they got a good sense of humor. Comedy is a good place. When you watch them performing, it's more like they got a gun in their head going, can you see me now? Can you see me now? And I can generally tell which is the prince or the POW, just by the way they handle applause at the end of the act. The prince or princess, whatever you want to say, can't get enough applause. They stay up there until it's all just about gone. 
they bow to the audience. They're just, give me that standing ovation. Come on, come on. They just, it's natural. It feels good to them. The POW finishes the set. They jam that mic back into the stand and leave as fast as possible just in case the audience might change their mind. They're, they don't quite have that sort of, sort of same gyroscope. Tell them that the applause and approval is okay. Can you uh, uh, do you want to go out on a limb and name a few prince or princesses and a couple of POWs? <laughs> name, name a few people. I I think sometimes watching applause. I mean, and I'm and by the way, it's not good or bad, and it doesn't mean they don't have their own issues. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that the, you know one's easier than the other. Um, I think uh, Seinfeld probably a POW. I mean, excuse me, what am I saying? Seinfeld right. probably a prince. Ellen DeGeneres, a prince. I'd say Sam Kennison, probably POW. Um, yeah, I, th- I think there's a probably guesstimates. I'm going to guess Robin Williams, prince. Oh, yeah, I would say. Right. Absolutely. From what, Absolutely. I've, from what I've learned of his background, I mean, he was seemed, mm-hmm. seemed like prince. His mom seemed, his mom seemed to like, give him a lot of support. Yeah. yeah, I think that's it. I mean, you know, just guessing. And so what uh, what have you learned? Because I know the book is written. We're just waiting to see it. What have you learned about yourself? You uh, And uh, as you said, you know, you, you were writing. You were doing, you know, comedy writing, TV, that kind of stuff. But when you sit down and write a book, and this is something I know something about, when you sit down and write a book, especially about your own experiences, in order for it to really work, you have to kind of get inside your own head and you have to think about the things you've said and done. What did you learn yeah. about yourself from this process? Well, I learned that... that um I really needed to do it. That was one of the things I learned. I mean, I knew I, I, I learned I needed to do it before I knew I needed to do it. When I was talking to people who were there when I was younger, when I was talking to people I grew up with, and they told me I was always funny. I was kind of surprised by that. I didn't think I was always funny. Then people were telling me, no, you were funny all the time. You were funny when you were younger. And that kind of surprised me. When I was uh, talking to um, people about the stories and some some of the stuff I had notes, I had like notebooks and I had little things in it and some things I just remembered. And I was surprised by, um, how much I thought about it, how much it, it, it just, my entire life back then was, was thinking about comedy. And it took me a while to get that. I mean, when I first was doing it, you're just trying to get laughs. So you're not thinking of any perspective. You know, I understand you just got your head down trying to dig in and get laughed. So I didn't have any kind of perspective. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. This is one of those stories I wanted to tell. Um, about 82, I moved out to Los Angeles. And every night after the show at the Improv or Melrose, comics, we'd generally go over to Canners because you could have a drink and get something to eat. Mm-hmm. So one day we're sitting there drinking and eating, and I see Maury Amsterdam sitting at another table with a couple of older guys. Now, I don't know how old Maury, Maury was at the time. I didn't really realize how old he was. But to me, he was Buddy on Dick Van Dyke show, which was a, a hugely popular. It was one of my favorite sitcoms growing up. So we're sitting and I, I you know, I'm half drunk, maybe half to three quarter, maybe, maybe seven eighths drunk, whatever. I go, let's go over and say hello to, to Buddy. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Let's go say hello to Maury. My ignorance. I didn't know who the guy was in showbiz. I just knew he was an actor on a sitcom I used to like. So we go over there and we go introduce ourselves. I forget who was with me. I kind of have it in my mind, but I, I'm not really sure. And he goes, hey, yeah, boys, I know who you guys are. You do the comedy over at Bud Friedman. It's like over there once in a while and I watch. It's, it's good what you're doing. And we kind of go like, oh, yeah, but we don't do like you guys do. We don't do jokes like you guys used to do jokes. You know, we talk about our lives. You know, we're, we're like, you know, we're like the young guys and we're kind of a little bit full of ourselves. And he goes, really, boys, you really you're doing something different. That's fantastic. What are you doing? Tell me one of these things you do. And I tell him one of my jokes. He goes, that was done by Richie Craig Jr. in 1937, and he does a joke the way Richie Craig Jr. did it. Boom. <laughs> and then we tell him another joke. That's fantastic. That was done by Fred Allen in 1931, and he, boom. And he just, boom, boom, boom. Every time we did a joke, he told us how it was done by who did it and what year. He said, you might fool me with a couple of the drug jokes. I could turn most of those into drunk jokes, but eh, nothing's new, boys. But whatever you're doing, have fun with it. God bless you. And he goes back to eating his sandwich. You know, we walk away. So then next night, I go back in the improv, and I tell Bud Freeman what happened. And Bud Freeman laughs, man. He laughs. He goes, come here. And he takes me over to the adult table. Bud had this big round table. I always called it the adult table. Everybody did, I think. 
big round table. That's where the star sat. And I think Carl Reiner was sitting there, and it, it might have been, you know, Shelly Berman. A couple of big stars are sitting there. And Bud tells him what I did. Tell him what happened. So I tell him what happened. They all start laughing. Ah, you ran into a buzzsaw. Maury knows all the jokes because he wrote most of the jokes. <laughs> if, and then they start telling Maury Amsterdam stories. He sold Milton Berle the same jokes five times over. He keeps selling the same joke. He changes to a doctor joke, a lawyer joke. He keeps, they're like telling these stories. They didn't forget I'm even there. They just start telling. So I got to go look up Maury Amsterdam, find out who he was. I found out when he's 19, he was a vaudeville performer when he was young he was writing for will rogers when he was 19 and he had this whole so i had to start going you know i'm in this business i don't even know anything about it mm. so i started reading books more than just i think everybody in my generation read phil Berger's last laugh you know in 75 or 77 whenever that came out but i started reading you know i started reading and trying to get a grip on what i was doing or what business i was in trying to learn something about it it, it's it's interesting. I, over the weekend, I I discovered David Steinberg's uh, new podcast, and he had Carl Reiner on, and they were talking about the Dick Van Dyke Show and how it was cast, and how that uh, Maury Amsterdam and uh, Rose Marie both wrote comedy. They they wrote jokes as much as as acted, and they wound up with a. a he said it was perfect because they've got they've got Carl himself, uh, and, and they've got Rose Marie and and Maury Amsterdam, and of course Dick Van Dyke. But basically, it's a show about comedy writers, and they hired mostly comedy writers to star <laughs> yeah. in it. And yeah. he was talking about how Maury just, you know, people just don't recognize that he had, you know, decades of writing jokes and performing. And most everybody just remembers him as that uh, little little guy on uh, the Dick Van Dyke show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, when I walked up to him in, <laughs> in my stupidity at Cantor's in 82. He'd been writing comedy for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, you can't know everything. And it, the good no, thing. No, you got to learn. I'm just saying, I got, I, got, I got my hubris knocked out of me. Mm -hmm. And so I got a little humble. And I went, you know, I need to learn about this thing. I, I went through uh, about two years ago, I found a source, uh, an app on, on the phone uh, where you could listen to old time radio. And this one actually had the entire run of Jack Benny from his very first radio shows where he was like an MC basically all the way through like 1953, 1954. Every night I fell asleep listening to a Jack Benny show and then I, I, then I went through the Bob Hope shows and the Fred Allen and people just have no idea – how smart that stuff was. I mean, it's just like, oh, Jack Benny, you know, he had a couple of gimmicks. But no, the writing for these shows was so impeccably smart and clever. Yeah. We just yeah. have no... And, and he, Jack Benny is a perfect example of how, you know, technology changes the medium quite often. And Jack Benny was not successful in vaudeville. He was a very soft-spoken guy. And back in vaudeville, you had to yell and scream these theaters. You had no electronic amplification. Electronic amplification comes in, and Benny becomes a star. Conversational comedy comes into being. He goes on the radio, and he's a hit on the radio because he's very conversational and intimate in the way radio was. And I, I just love that whole – I love the, the way things happen. I, lo I love the whole Fred Allen, Jack Benny. They perfectly – I always believe – Again, it's just me. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I just believe that most comics are more of a performer or more of a writer. Those are the two things you have to do. To perform stand-up comedy, write and perform. Mm -hmm. And most comics are better at one than the other. I always thought I was a better writer than a performer. I think most comics probably identify more with one than the other. And the Jack Benny, Fred Allen feud is a perfect example of that. Jack Benny was a performer. He was not a writer. He was a great editor. But Fred Allen was a great writer. Not as good a performer as Benny. But a great writer. I mean, that's why Jack Benny could go to television. Fred Allen didn't do well on television. When television came out, Fred Allen wasn't really a great performer on television. But he was a killer writer, man. He was a great writer. I see. I still see one of his jokes done by other comics all the time. His his joke was, "California is a great place to live if you're an orange." And I've heard so many comics do versions of that. You know, the Bronx is a great place to live if you're a bullet right. or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, I, I, I'd love to see somebody take those old radio shows of his and turn them into a TV show and, and kind of show us like what's going on the backstage. And, you know, it, I think it'd be a great, uh, 
Well, well, people have written that Jack Benny's radio show was actually a template for sitcoms. It was actually right. like one of the first sitcoms. That right, I yeah. think the Goldbergs. I think the Goldbergs was also kind of set up as a radio sitcom too. Uh, Amos and Andy, the whole yeah, the whole bunch. Well, uh, all right. So I'm just realizing how long I've kept you. Do you have a little more time? A couple more things I'd like yeah, to ask you about. Yeah. All right. I'm having fun. I mean, whatever you want. I mean, no one's going to hear this after we're done. So it's just <laughs> I'm we sorry, just man. have to. That we, was, you know, I think back. I say some stuff. As soon as I stopped <laughs> saying it, I went. But it's a dumb thing to start off a show that way. Let's start off the show with the fact that nobody's going to care what we're doing. That is, <laughs> it was, you know, I, you know, I, I say things that sometimes after I say them, I go, Gee, you know, but. But it's I say, okay. So if if you and I, if we entertain ourselves here, then at least <laughs> I've been we go away, right? And we go away entertained. And then if people, if other people pick up on it, I look at that as a bonus. All right. All right. So let's talk about the movie. You 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 wrote this uh, short film, uh, the last lift of the leg. There's uh, a great poster that goes with it. Uh, tell me how this came about, and and you were also telling me before that this is actually going to lead to some more shorts. Well, Mark Friedman is an uh, an actor and a producer, and he contacted me, said I want to produce a short instead of just getting a reel of all these things I've done. I wanted to create something different. I'm with this actors group in New York, and they're really good, and there's a lot of talent, and uh, I got some money available, so I want to. Uh, will you write something? I gave him a bunch of ideas, and one of the ideas was about a pet funeral. I, I I live in Los Angeles, and I've been to a pet funeral. I thought the f- idea was ripe for comedy, so he liked the idea, and so we re- wrote. A, I wrote a um, a short, fifteen minute, fifteen pages, fifteen minute short of a pet funeral, and I thought, you know, they're going to do it sort of like our gang productions. You know, it'd be like a, one of their kids will bring out his iPhone and they'll shoot it, and the kid will edit it on the iPhone, and it'll be that. But they went wild. I mean, they built sets. They the, the acting was great. You know, when you write things and you, you hope it's funny and I'm sitting in it. I can't remember when I wrote something that I've written stuff for television, but you never sit in a theater with other people to find out whether anybody's actually laughing at it. Mm. This is the first time I've had that experience and people are laughing. And then the actors were getting laughs with things that I had not written, which was even interesting. Mm. And uh, they were getting laughs, you know, with, with the way they said it or the laughs. You know, they were they was just it was great. It was a great experience. I had a fun and afterwards, uh, he was, and his partners, they were talking, and we were talking at, at the Tribeca restaurant and um, the Tribeca Grill. And uh, they had an idea for something, and they go, we want you to write a couple more because um, you know, we, wanna, we, we have an idea to do something more with this. It must be very well, exciting for you. Yeah, it was it was fun. It, the whole experience was fun. It was fun meeting the actors afterward. It was fun sitting there and watching people laugh at something I wrote. And of course, they were getting the laughs. They were performing it. But let's, I've written for other comedians. I've heard other comics get laughs with material that I've written. So I know that experience, and I love it. I don't care. I just love hearing the laughter. I just love hearing this music to me. I can hear the highs and lows. I can hear the men and the women laughing. If it's too much men, you know, I'd be on stage. And if if the if there was too much bass in the laughter of the audience, I go. I'm not reaching the women. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta. What am I doing? You know. I I can play it. I can feel it. And uh, I, I I just love to listen to them laugh. Yeah. Uh, so there will be more. There will be more. There will be blood. There will be more. <laughs> there will be blood. Let's hope there's no blood. Um, yeah. And, and I'm, I I just continue writing. I look. I'm on the road. I got to do something. You know. Right. Well, and speaking of the road, that's where I wanted to go next and, and, and maybe kind of wrap up with this. Uh, I mentioned before uh, that you are at the Borgata in Atlantic City through January 30th, and you're going to Cleveland Hilarities February 3rd to 6th. Let's get all the plug stuff in. Uh, but tell me about a typical day like today, and I know you've got a bit of a, a cold going, and, and I appreciate you staying with us so long. Tell me, you wake up in a, in a, in a, in a strange city. What's your day like? How, you know, what's your routine, and, and what does it take to get you to break that routine? Uh, relatives, I went to have lunch with my cousin today here. Otherwise, I'm pretty set in my routine. I get up, I pray, meditate, I exercise, I eat. I have coffee between the prayer, meditation, and the exercise because the old man needs a little caffeine. <laughs> and I exercise, and then I try to write. Uh, I don't really work that much on stand-up material. If something lands on its feet and it's funny, and I'll try it on stage, I'll take it and do it. But I'm writing other things. I'm writing another script right now. And, um, uh, and that's what I do. I'm, I'm trying. I got to I got to go to Facebook anonymous. I got to break this Facebook addiction right now. Uh, 
and I'll, I'll do that so I can get more work done. Mm. But that's a real time suck. It is. It is. That's cut down on my reading, and it's cut down on my writing. Now, where in that schedule, uh, where do the hookers and the cocaine fit in? <laughs> I got that all out of the way by 85. I, got that, I, I packed it in as tight as I could, got as much out of the way as I could. There were no uh, hookers per se, um, uh, but uh, there was a lot of party and a lot of fun. Back. There, you know, it was a time. We were like little rock stars running around the country in the early 80s in these comedy clubs. And um, and there were a lot of boys and a lot of um, uh, women, a lot of a lot of a lot of men and women, a lot of alcohol and drugs, and things happen. Things happen when you put men and women and alcohol and drugs in a room. Things happen. Mm. That's what I've heard. I, I don't know. For yeah, sure. yeah. No, I mean it was it was <laughs> it, it was it was silly. I mean, not look. And this is comedy. This is comedy action, not rock star action, not musical action. Like we we know there's a a, a difference. There's a difference. Um, because I think uh, co- comics get more psychotic groupies than <laughs> rock stars do. As, I don't know if that's possible, but I think they do. I, I, well, I can only go based on what I see on TV, and I'm thinking of episodes of Marin and, and Louie. I would, I'm assuming that based on those, those shows, yeah, you guys are not doing as well as the... Uh, Look, I'm, ama- the I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Amazed that no comics were actually killed by a jealous boyfriend or a husband on the road back in that time. I'm just amazed. Nobody cared. Nobody has questions. Nobody cared. It was just you know grab what you can and move on. And um, yeah, there was there was a lot of stuff. I got a lot of those stories too. You would have figured that a guy like Kinnison and all his stuff it would have ended in gunfire and not a not a car accident. <laughs> Sam was wild, man. When I when I got sober, I'd still hang out with him once in a while. And he used to call me his double agent from God. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he was wild. He was wild. All right. So, uh, do you want to do you want to tell us anything beyond hilarities? Since we're as we wrap up, is there, a, there a gigs after hilarities you want to mention? Well, there, there there are, but you know, I do cruise ships. I'm I'm in. This is my circling the drain tour. <laughs> so Jesus. I do cruise ships, country clubs, senior citizen retirement villages and occasionally some comedy clubs and casinos like the laugh factory in Las Vegas and Reno and Bud's improv and Tahoe. There's but I, I do hilarities is one of the rare ones. I do, I think zanies in Chicago. I did last year. Hmm. I don't do many comedy clubs anymore. I understand why I'm not, there's no bitterness or anything, but, but this is my circling the drain tour. So I don't like to give out too much ahead of time. Cause I don't know if I'll actually make it there. Oh God. Okay. All right. You heard it here first. Uh, folks, uh, so you can see uh, stand-up comedian Rich Scheidner at the Borgata in Atlantic City through January 30th and at the Cleveland Hilarities February 3rd to 6th. Beyond that, cross your fingers and maybe check his website <laughs> or, or his Facebook this page. The first comic to ever like, try to get promotion by threatening to die. I'm <laughs> seeing you dying. <laughs> uh, keep an eye out for his memoir. All these jokes must go <laughs> below cost. How do we do it? Volume. <laughs> Uh, well, I got to finish the plugs. I, I'll kill my. You both kill me if I don't get through this. Uh, watch for his memoir sometime this year, "Kicking Through the Ashes: My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Explosion," and his short film, uh, "The Last Lift of the Leg," which, uh, presuming, we'll see in some festivals as the year That's winds they, down. Yeah, they're entering into festivals now. That's right. All right, uh, give out your website, Rich. Uh, RichScheidner dot com. R i t c h s h y d n e r dot com. One word. I'm on Facebook, same name, same but, name on Twitter. I don't ever do that, but whatever. Don't look for him on Facebook because he just can't handle any. I gotta get off it, man. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get off that electronic crack. It is, it is that. Um, Rich Scheidner, it was uh, delightful to, to have you on. Uh, thank wow. you very much for starting our tenth year. Uh, with Can the, I come with back in two weeks like Shimmel? Let me come back in two weeks like Shimmel. I want to come. When was Shimmel back? Three weeks. I want to make it two. Three, three weeks. We'll, we'll have you back in two weeks. <laughs> All right, we'll have to find out if you live through, uh, you know, the Borgata and hilarity. So come back in two weeks. We'll All right, Bob. All right, thank you very much, Rich.
Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of career opening act comedians whose concept of killing is the only way they're ever going to middle. In the new <laughs> media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs>